Our next speaker, Avi Reichenthal, is the president and CEO of 3D Systems. And under his leadership, that company is redefining and shaping the way we design, what we create, and how we manufacture. Ladies and gentlemen, tell us more about the world of 3D printing. Avi Reichenthal. Good morning. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. I want to talk to you about uh, a technology that I believe will redefine and shape the future in every walk of life and in every part of our creativity, productivity, and learning. And that's why I defined it as manufacturing the future. Can we have the audio, please? What the Xerox machine or the word processor or both of those do for, uh, for the office environment. Yeah. So uh, we invented uh, 3D printing 30 years ago. Believe it or not, uh, 3D Systems, the company that invented it all, were an overnight success 30 years in the making. We, we can tone down the, the audio. Uh, so we're an overnight success 30 years in the making. Uh, and it's just coming into uh, the mainstream because of the convergence of uh, other enabling exponential technologies like infinite computing power in the cloud, sensing, robotics, gamification, big data, that all together are making the impossible possible. And I firmly believe that 3D printing will completely reshape and redefine the way that we design, what we create, how and where we manufacture. And it's going to bring about a renaissance of localized distributed manufacturing. Uh, you can read all about 3D systems where the inventor, where the advancer, uh, we're the democratizer, we're the larger, largest player in this field, and we're absolutely passionate about disrupting manufacturing as we know it and reimagining the consumer experience and education, and I'll talk about both of those. What's the big deal about 3D printing? The big deal about 3D printing is that for the first time ever since the last industrial revolution, complexity is free. Think about that. I'll say that again. This is an opportunity to dismantle all of the traditional design and manufacturing paradigms and all of the traditional constraints that prevent us from really designing for function and for purpose. So what does it mean? It means that for the first time we can have open-ended economic possibilities. It means that it could really be mind-bending in terms of the innovation possibilities. It means that there is unlimited economic and social impact that's possible here, because for the first time, we can do two things. One, we can mass customize. We can make millions of one of a kinds because there's no need for tooling. There's no need for inventory. Uh, the sustainability aspects are mind-boggling because there is zero to no, little to no waste. It consumes about half the energy. Uh, if you can localize it, you don't have to bring it from far away and have all the carbon footprint implications from freight. It turns supply chain upside down. Uh, and the other big aspect is for the first time, we can also make millions of identical parts of greater complexity. And I'll show you examples starting with the next one with the audio, please. Shape of a turbine blade and where the holes go, what the coating is, that might be the difference in one or two points of fuel burn in the way a jet engine works. And that's ten, uh, billions of dollars for our customers in terms of performance. Now, the way that's made today is kind of subtracting, right? You, you get a block of something and you weld it and you arc it and you you know, take the, the scrap and it goes someplace, and that's how you make those parts today. And 3D printing allows you to make that product right the first time. It allows you to make it from the core up, so you basically don't have as much waste. The tooling's cheaper, 
the cycle times are faster, and that is the Holy Grail. And, and that is the holy grail uh, for many companies, not just for General Electric, because for the first time, by virtue of being able to manufacture highly efficient products, we can begin to change economy and actually challenge economy of scales by creating economies of savings. And that is why companies like General Electric has made this a strategic initiative. They're spending billions of dollars to basically completely redefine how they design and manufacturing in the future with real, tangible, and impactful economic benefits. The same is happening in automotive. Uh, and in automotive, you, uh, we are experiencing a steady migration of the adoption from design to tooling to bridge manufacturing and all the way to, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, low volume, high value parts, including some uh, very demanding under hood applications. And my expectation is that uh, in the coming years, uh, it will mainstream into production floor manufacturing uh, across the board. One of the uh, most exciting and fastest growing areas, at least for 3D systems, is the whole universe of patient-specific medical devices. Think about this. As we sit here today, every in-the-ear hearing aid device is already 3D printed across the universe. Most of your dental restorations, crown, bridge, partial, and implant guys are all 3D printed. And what you see on the right is that increasingly many of the uh, full knee and hip replacement procedures are also 3D printed, but interestingly, all of the medical instruments are now patient specific. They are extracted from your CT scan and every one of the jigs and fixtures, tools and instruments that go into the actual full knee replacement is made for you. What does that mean? It means that it eliminates all the variability in, in orthopedic surgical skills. It means that it extends the quality of the procedure and its life. Uh, and just anecdotally, I'll tell you that it takes a good orthopedic surgeon about 500 procedures to really perfect their skill. You don't want to be under the knife when they do their 399th procedure. <laughs> so you might say to me, hey, Avi, this is all nice. Does it really scale? Can you really see this as the engine that powers the factory of the future? And my answer is absolutely. It's happening in the here and now. See Invisalign, the company that makes the clear braces, a disruptive technology that started by two Stanford engineers 10 years ago, is now uh, the fastest growing company in the area of aligning your teeth, disrupting the wire and bracket. And how do they do it? They do it with 65 printers in a room about the size of this auditorium in a lights out factory that manufactures millions of one of a kind patterns 24 seven day in and day out in a factory of the future that has fully automated and mechanized all of the upstream and downstream applications. So last year, this company that started you know, as an idea by two students a decade ago, manufactured over 17.2 million unique and distinct aligners for you and me using 3D printing. So does it scale? You bet. And what also is interesting is that you know, there is a great deal of debate now uh, in, in the mainstream media and amongst uh, so-called industry experts uh, with uh, the question of, you know, will we have a 3D printer in every home? Will it ever really uh, hit the manufacturing floor in a meaningful way? And I think that these are the wrong questions to ask. The right question to ask is, 
in what room in my house will my 3D printer reside? <laughs> Is it going to be in my kitchen? Is it going to be in my living room because it's going to be part of my entertainment? Is it going to be part of my man cave? Uh, is it going to be in my wardrobe because I'm a fashionista and I want something really unique? Uh, in what part of the manufacturing process will it be implemented? And so I want to go quickly through some of those possibilities that in my mind are nothing short of mind-bending because I happen to think that some of the most sophisticated and intelligent designs were already patented by nature. And if you don't believe me, take a good look at the mirror when you get up in the morning and look at yourself. You're pretty intelligent and smart and innovative creature. And with 3D printing, for the first time, we have the opportunity to get closer and closer to organic biomimicry in the kind of functionality and intelligent complexity that we can incorporate into our designs. We also have an opportunity to create completely new classes of medical devices that were prescribed for me. Look at what we are doing at 3D Systems with uh, allowing amputees, for example, to restore their symmetry and to do it in a way that is fashionable and authentic and celebrated where they don't have to hide their conditions. Look at what we do with ortho orthotic and orthopedic braces that are fashionable, ventilated, dishwashable, and cool to wear, and were made for me because I could scan them in my medical office using three Kinects. Look at what we're doing in the area of pediatric bracing and scoliosis bracing by taking devices that were cumbersome, labor-intensive, and awkward and turning them into something that is functional, fun, fashionable, and useful. What about the Internet of Things? I believe that 3D printing will be the intel inside millions of new business models. Look at the one on the left of your screen. This is a startup in London, started by Ellis Taylor, who came from the BBC. She went to a show. She saw how kids' toys are made, and she asked herself, why don't unleash kids' creativity? Why not unleash the internet and mobile devices and big data and gamification? and create a new disruptive business model, why not take Mattel and Hasbro on by creating this immersive educational experience for kids to create toys that mean something to them? Look at what we're doing on the right with Cubify, which is our, if you will, iTunes for all things 3D, and begin to imagine all the possibilities for new business models because the playing field is completely leveled. And the next disruption may not come from a big company, it may come from you know, three guys and gals in a garage in Houston, Texas, that today can access the same power, the same technology, the same capability that traditionally was only reserved for the pocketed organizations. Look at what we're doing with Disney. Disney is using photogrammetry, which is uh, taking you know, a bunch of frames, 2D frames, meshing them together into a 3D model. And on the left, you can see how a girl can begin to create a selfie of her Disney princess. And on the right, you can see how you know, all of our Star Wars fans can immerse themselves into a scene of the movie. Uh, and in both cases, through the magic of photogrammetry, sensing, mobile devices, cloud computing, you can begin to be part of the story. And from a brand perspective and from a merchandising perspective, for the first time, we can co-create with our heroes. We can become part of the journey and part of the brand experience. 
look at how Stormtroopers was launched. The day that the movie was launched, you could make a selfie of yourself. And by the same token, uh, we are bringing to the living room and to the family room printers like the Cube, which is the first ever real plug and play Apple-esque device that is now sold in hundreds of staples and home and office depots and uh, soon uh, in other fine retail outlets all over the world because we are democratizing access to these devices. Who do you want to be? Feel free to raise the audio a little bit. Oh, cool. I made it, Mom. 3D me. Happy anniversary, baby. 3D me. I hope I look this good on my wedding day. Wild East, Wild West, 3D Me, bring out your best. I can slay dragons, 3D Me, who do you want to be? So what you saw Disney doing with uh, kind of a 3D photo booth, you can now do by uploading two pictures from your smartphone to Cubify and create your own selfie. Look at what we just did with Manchester United. We're doing it with basketball. Uh, it's just the beginning of completely unleashing the ability to personalize and, and mass customize in every field. Uh, I don't know about you, I like sweets, and uh, part of my uh, skunk works as, as a CEO is to experiment with fun projects that launch new technologies. So on the left you can see that we're printing now in sugar, on the right you can see my personal version of uh, a Keurig chocolate machine, a single serve chocolate machine for your kitchen. But what's behind that is, I mean, look, I think that we have this unwritten covenant in society about indulgence. And I think that uh, 3D printing could experience probably faster and mainstream through my mouth than my brain. But behind that, I'm interested in uh, personalized nutrition. And when you think about uh, some of the sensing technology that uh, Dr. Topol was talking about, and you begin to calculate with the possibilities here to begin to print uh, personalized nutritional foods for me based on my vital signs, based on the time of day, and based on what I need, that is a game changer, and it goes well beyond what I can do by decorating wedding cakes today. And that's kind of you know, where my long-term head is at. Uh, this is gonna disrupt fashion. It's coming, and it's coming to a department store near you. you know, that movement is afoot every day and in every way. It's certainly going to bring about a completely new era of implantables. Think of it in terms of your parts replacement, you know, as others are sequencing your genes, and as you can now take, you know, 23andMe and do the tests, uh, you know, this technology will come in and begin to allow you to replace your parts for the purpose of life extension. Believe it or not, it's easier to print an organ than it is to print a blade for the next generation jet engine. And it's gonna happen in the next five to 10 years. I wanna talk about this gun that's in the news. It's called the Liberator. It's a three, now, first of all, I didn't understand the story until I read it like three times. And the reason is they use the word printer. There's something called a 3D printer. They should not use that word printer. You think of paper. It's not a, something that makes paper. They should call it a manufacturer or something. What it is, it's a machine. Boy, they should have this on Star Trek, or they probably do. <laughs> that you can put in plastic, uh, raw materials and it makes something plastic. You can make a, a doorstop or jewelry or a sex toy, I guess, you know, a 3D object. So, of course, this is America. We made a gun. <laughs> Duh. Some guy in Texas, of course, Texas, <laughs> made a gun which he calls the Liberator and it's plastic and this... You get the gist of it. Uh, what... 
I wanted to share with you is that with all of the unimagined, we're going to have the unintended. And the reality is that with exponential technologies, the rate and pace of development far exceeds society's legislative platforms and regulatory capabilities to comprehend what's going to happen. And uh, there are certainly lots of possible downsides here. Our job is to comprehend them and to sensitize everybody because this is the undesired part of the human condition. And if you don't believe me, listen to my good friend Mark Goodman when he talks about it uh, some more. Uh, with that, uh, you'll see amazing things happen, like uh, three students winning the NASA grant to put 3D printers on the space station, uh, like people uh, doing things for the blind by uh, creating uh, basically the alternative to Braille where you can begin to learn by touching. And the most exciting thing uh, for me is education, giving young kids the opportunity to connect virtual with actual, giving them tomorrow's uh, skills today, doing it by not just teaching them about STEM and STEAM skills, but by turning every subject from art to biology to geography to uh, just creativity into something that connects virtual with actual. And to me, this is an opportunity to create peer-to-peer -peer literacy, the literacy of shapes, the literacy of objects, the literacy of, lear of learning. Uh, and believe it or not, kids really get it. They understand it, they embrace it, and it's an opportunity to really give them tomorrow's competitive skills today. So I want to leave you uh, with this thought. Uh, this is happening. It's happening here, it's happening now. Uh, it's going to change every part of our lives in impactful and meaningful ways. You have an opportunity, you have a choice. The choice is to disrupt or to be disrupted because we live in exponential times and it requires consequential thinking and exponential leadership. If you don't believe me, look what happened to these fine business leaders you know, who were stuck in the paradigm of their denial. And with that, I'll just tell you that the journey continues, and I hope you'll be on it with me. Thanks. Avi, thank you for that. So I want to zoom in on the last part about the hopes for the future. So with this democratization of craftsmanship, um, Many of us have seen really amazing things happen. For example, one of my friends goes down to Haiti with a 3D printer. She finds where some water facility is broken and prints the washer that fixes the whole thing, yeah. or prints the umbilical cord clips that provide the hospital what it needs for five cents. So if you were on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine a few years from now, and you could hold one item that you think best represents how this uh, has or will change the world for the better, what would that item be? Well, that item is probably going to be uh, a personalized nutritional bar because I think that uh, in the world that we live in, there are opportunities to uh, solve some really big problems that can impact billions of people. And a personalized nutritional bar can help feed the hungry, but it could also help many of the better and well-to-do people live better, longer, and more meaningful lives. Okay, great. Thanks, Avi. Thank you for being here.